How are you? Welcome in. We are up and live on our Thursday. It's the Ken's Five Weather Minds, Weather Classroom. And joining me is meteorologist <laughs> Stacia Wilson. So glad you're here. It's great to be here, Bill. Um, I was gone a couple days this week, wanted to go home and check on my family. And uh, How's family? Family is good. Family is good. Everybody's good. Great. North Texas. But I had been hearing about this. You started talking about it last week. And so this is my first chance to actually experience it, and I'm super excited. I've got a co-teacher today. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we started Monday and launched this mainly because of the distance learning that's set up for all our school districts now until April 24th, for most cases. Mm -hmm. But we want to continue this as long as there's distance learning, because here's a great opportunity for you guys to learn a little bit about meteorology and give your parents and grandparents a little break. There <laughs> you, you know? go, right? You know, yes, just I'm sit sure them in front of the set. And we're <laughs> keeping these videos up, and you can log in for Monday's discussion of the atmosphere, Tuesday, severe weather, which today we're going to touch on a little bit because we're going to be talking about thunderstorms. But before we do that, Stacia Wilson, I want to talk about your interest in meteorology, how that started, how you then parlayed it into a degree in meteorology. I mean, it's a great story because there's a lot of aspiring meteorologists out there. Yeah, and you know what, and Bill, you're definitely inspiring those younger kiddos too because he's so fun to watch and he truly loves thank what he you, does. Thank you, thank you. And I've watched him for years. And honestly, I always thought meteorology was amazing, but I thought it was way above my head. I, mean, just, I just thought there's no way I could ever do that. Um, and so I graduated from University of Texas at Austin, the Longhorn, at, not gonna tell you when, Right. Definitely. There yeah. Yeah. Okay. But no. And then I thought, I want to be a journalist. And I had had that interest ever since I was a little girl. And I loved watching the news when I was a kid. We always had it on at dinner with my parents. Um, I know they say to talk to your kids, but we watched the news. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, I really just truly fell in love with it. So I went to UT and I graduated um, with a journalism degree. And I got my first job in Lake Charles, Louisiana, which is interesting because Bill had Same lived here. there. Yeah. Yes. And when I lived there, I met Bill's stepfather. So so, and had never even met Bill. So it's, it's yeah, a, we didn't know each other then. It is a small world, but truly. But we began our TV careers there. So did Paul Morellis. Yes, Paul was in Lake Charles for a while. Yeah. Some small little town in southwest Louisiana. Uh, really nice people. So I did reporting there, and then I was in Lubbock for a while. And Lubbock has crazy weather. I oh, mean, man. you would be driving along and look, oh, there's a tornado. In fact, I had a roommate. We were in the car <sighs> once, and that happened. And I thought, how can you be so nonchalant? But they just have extreme weather up there on a regular basis. Regularly. Yeah. So, and it's every season. Mm -hmm. And the meteorologists there, getting to watch them in action was just, it was truly, it was really impressive because they were great and they had a lot to follow. They had a lot to share with the public. And I thought, wow, that's so great. We have these people that can relate to the public. What's going on? What's happening? Because otherwise, it's, it's a lot of people wouldn't know exactly. um, if they didn't have that, that source. So, Hey, speaking of the public, I want to give some shout outs, make sure we're up and going good oh, yeah. here and say some hellos on our Facebook feed. Again, we're live on Facebook and then these videos will stay there. Um, see, now I don't have, where is it? Where is it? Come on now. All right, I'm looking for those videos too. Right. I'm going to make this a lot shorter story because <laughs> oh, go we've got some yeah. thunder to talk about. But long You're story, good. a little bit shorter. After living in Lubbock and reporting, then I was in New Orleans right after Hurricane Katrina, and I saw up close just how destructive, you know, how destructive and how tragic weather can cause for people. I mean, weather can result in. And I thought, you know, if these people had no idea if it was back in the day and they didn't have meteorologists to tell them this hurricane's coming, it's a category five, hit landed a category three. If they didn't have that source of information. They, right. you know, the day before Katrina was sunny and beautiful. There was, Katrina was a huge hurricane. Um, and so that's why it's just, I think it's such an amazing career. And then Everybody. I came here to Ken's and I reported for a number of years and I anchored. And then one day I decided that, you know what, I'm just going to try it because online was so much more prevalent. You all have the opportunity. You're watching us online at home. And I thought, you know, I can go back to Oops. school. And uh, I did online through Mississippi State for over a year. And I thought, wow, this is taking a really long time. <laughs> so I started exploring other options, a way that I could get it done as fast as possible because I wanted to be able to start forecasting the weather at Kent's. So um, Bill was awesome. All the guys here helped me. Paul helped me. Bill helped me. Jeremy helped me. And here I am. I finished, I guess, at the end of 2018. 
And yeah, I've been doing with her since. So it's awesome. He is the expert. And so no, it, no, I'm not. <laughs> well, I'm not. It's great I'm to watch. I'm still learning you. a lot. Thank you very much. God's glory. But here, here's the beauty of it is that if you want to stay in San Antonio, mm -hmm. UIW. If you want to stay in Texas, Texas A&M. Sorry, Longhorn. I know. Texas Tech. Mm -hmm. If you want to go national, Penn State University, yeah. where you took some classes there right, as well, that's right? Where I great finishing. meteorology school. So yeah. there's so many great options for those of you who want to study this science. And again, it's an imperfect science, but it's one. And your interest, as you said, when you start feeling it and seeing it, mm -hmm. it, it happened for me when I moved south. Mm -hmm. In the Northeast, the weather is really not as big a player as it is in the South. There's more life-threatening weather in the South than there is in the Northeast. It'll happen up there, but in New Jersey. Hurricanes aren't a big issue. Nor'easters can be. Mm -hmm. But you typically you had Superstorm Sandy, but I wasn't there for that. So it's here, as I always like to put it, weather is the most common denominator of man. You know, it affects everyone. And it, whether rich, poor, whatever it is, it's weather. It affects us all. And it's kind of what we're going through right now. This coronavirus outbreak and pandemic is affecting us all, right? It's a common denominator. And it's kind of those moments where we kind of wake up. Yeah. You know, and we see what we have together and we get through it. It's a huge wake up. All right. So hi, Ryan. And there's Deborah Witt. Happy birthday, Deborah. <laughs> one of our great teachers in San Antonio. Fourth day, Maddie and Morgan are at Timberwood Park. Hi, Maddie. Hi, Morgan. Frank Modla, Accelerated Collegiate Academy students are in the house. So see, this is a Collegiate Academy. We've got to watch our P's and Q's today. <laughs> Gig em. There's Rachel. You got it. Who else is in here today? I want to say some hellos real quick. There's Round Trees in San Antonio. Good to see you guys. There's Kiera, 11 years old. Good to see you, Kiera. Thanks, Jana. There's Jay Bone. Good to see you. How you doing? Colton is in Bolverde. Good morning or good afternoon now, Colton. Good to see you guys. Okay. Oh, Debbie lived in Sulphur. Okay, right so right next to Lake Charles. Sulphur is interesting because it's an entire town full of sulfur basically <laughs> <laughs> so i think they thought we should just name this let's sulfur. name it sulfur <laughs> you know it smells what's like in sulfur, the air? right that's, sulfur, isn't it? <laughs> that's a great name yeah yeah and that's where i started my media career southwest daily news if you remember that newspaper it's still in print in sulfur louisiana i believe so that's where i got started in this crazy industry jeff coy burner on a break good to see you jeffrey coy there's eddie at lock hill elementary Kiddos are watching from Alamo Heights, ISD, 5th and 7th, Dallas and Holden. Hey, guys, good to see you. Noah and Amelia Howard from Denton, Texas. Wow, very nice. GOM Elementary's here. Live Oak is in. JJ and Eliana, good to see you guys. Kendall Cook, how are you? So here's what we'll do. We'll do our best to be answering some questions. That's what's great about having Stacia and myself both here. So while we're talking a little bit about Thunderstorm, and notice I went old school today. This is really now a yeah. classroom. He was stoked about this. He said, I tomorrow, really, I was really stoked. guess what I'm going to do? And I said, I'm going to bring in a dry erase board. So, <laughs> so here yes. it is. And I can't wait to see what you're going to do with it. You know, this is how we learned in school. Yeah, exactly. This mm -hmm. is how, you know, it was chalk. And we had to clap erasers after mm -hmm. class, too. We didn't even have dry erase boards. You know, I grew up in the 30s. No, not really. <laughs> All right. So today we're talking about the thunderstorm. And I want to first begin with the basic anatomy of a thunderstorm. What makes it a thunderstorm as opposed to a rain shower? You know, once we start building this. So you're going to have to be patient with my drawing. And we killed some lights so that you can see this. You're not going to see it really well. Thank you. But the best way to draw it, it almost looks like a tooth. You know, it, it, it really does extend out this way. Okay, and it shows that it builds out. It builds vertically and it starts to build out and that is basically the structure, almost like a tooth. Okay, and what's happening is you have a tremendous amount, I wanna change colors here, a tremendous amount of updraft going into the storm. Okay, this is the updraft. And then there's a tremendous amount of the opposite, downdraft inside of the thunderstorm. And when we talked about severe weather and these thunderstorms and when they're producing these kind of winds, this can get very turbulent inside. I mean, these wind speeds can reach 80 to 100 miles per hour without a problem. And remember, when it's bringing in that updraft, what's coming in is very warm, tropical, humid air. You know, a lot of times, I mean, thunderstorms are in every state. 
but here we've got an abundance of tropical moisture. So that's why here we can build these as high as 60,000 feet in the air. Well, let's just do this. 60,000 feet high. I mean, miles in the atmosphere. Down here is the surface. And if you remember Monday, we talked about where this occurs, and it's in the troposphere. So this is where the troposphere will build a thunderstorm. Now, Stacia, talk to me a little bit about what happens inside that storm and what's occurring once we see this updraft and downdraft and what we're looking for. All right. So essentially, like Bill mentioned, so you have these dark, puffy clouds where you have the, the updraft and the downdraft. And what's inside those clouds are tiny pieces, particles of ice and water. And so you're thinking, well, thunderstorm, thunder and lightning, right? How is that formed? Well, when those tiny particles, the ice and the water, bump against each other, it creates electricity. And that electricity, once it fills the cloud, because all these particles are bumping against each other, essentially, that's what forms lightning. That's that bolt, that flash of light that you see is really electricity. And it will either hit the ground or possibly even go to another cloud. Mm, good point. If it hits the ground, well, it's very hot. That lightning bolt's very hot. In fact, the surface of the lightning is hotter than the surface of the sun. That's how hot it is, if you can think how hot the sun is. So then once that hits the ground, you're thinking, well, how come we hear thunder later? What happens, it's so hot, the air around the lightning bolt gets hot too. And that hot air, it bumps in to the cooler air and it makes a vibration. Mm -hmm. So that's why the thunder is always later because those vibrations are happening all over the ground, the what, bouncing off buildings, whatever that vibration can bounce yeah, off of. Yeah. And so once those vibrations hit your ear, them exploding is the sound of thunder. That is the best way I thought I could explain that's that. That's really good. No, that's really good. Because it, and it gets your attention. I mean, I know a lot of you can get scared when you hear that clap of thunder right on top of you. When lightning occurs, and again, it's that positive and negative inside the cloud, and that strike channel is formed. So it's real interesting about how this happens because that charge comes out of the cloud or as Station mentioned, sometimes it's staying cloud to cloud mm -hmm. and it goes from one to another or just stays within that same cloud. But what we have learned is that even that cumulus cloud has electricity within it. But what can occur is that this strike channel begins to go down towards the surface. That positive and negative combination all the way down okay and here's what's really cool is that the atmosphere will warn you just out ahead of this because what will happen is if you're in the area of where that strike channel as it's called where the bolt will form it's called a strike channel before it becomes a bolt you'll feel it your hair will stand up on your arms you'll feel the hair on your neck stand up I mean it's that tingling sensation and you could even have hair stand up if you're looking at somebody their hair might start standing straight up that's the only warning you have as a matter of fact quick story my father was playing golf one time years ago I wasn't there playing with him that day but he was in a foursome of players and a thunderstorm was nearby and it wasn't even raining here's the thing lightning can occur without rain you don't need the rain to be falling. Lightning can be several miles away from the thunderstorm. Because again, cloud to cloud, and that charge is being carried, right? So they're out on the course, still trying to finish their round of golf, because again, it was cloudy, maybe some rain off in the distance, but it wasn't raining where they were. And he felt that feeling. He felt that tingling on his neck. He looked at his buddy. His hair started standing up. It's that static electricity. That is when you've got to hit the ground. You've got to get into that ball if you're out on a golf course. You know, they always even say, bury yourself in a sand trap, believe it or not. Yeah. Because well, you if you don't have a sand trap, a if there's one handy. Well, on <laughs> golf course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you that know? is, a, yeah, most definitely that's a safe place to be. And really, the best thing to do is just to don't put yourself in that situation. When there is a thunderstorm, Lightning obviously is going to be there too, as Bill mentioned. I mean, there are unfortunately people that do get hit by lightning. So All the time. If you're in a, you don't want to be in a field outside, kind of like a golf course. I mean, it's a golf course, not a field, but it's that flat ground. Yeah, it's a lot of flat area. And you're the only thing standing. Exactly. That's going to attract the lightning to you. Now, that's why they say also don't stand under a tree because you know, the tree's taller than you, but if it hits the tree and you're under the tree, it's right. a very good possibility you could get hurt too. Oh, absolutely. And the tree will explode because of the heat, the rapid heating of that tree sap. 
In fact, that's part of that thunder, as, as Stacia was mentioning, what, what, what creates that thunder is that rapid expansion of air. What we know about physics is that the air, when it's heated, will get larger. So it's colliding because it's enlarging. And it's happening so fast that, again, you're heating the air lightning fast, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. lightning. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for instance, the temperature, by the way, speaking of 60,000, we can even use this as an approximate, thank you, temperature in Fahrenheit of a lightning bolt. So let's say we're up in the cloud. Remember, as we're moving up into the cloud, temperatures are getting colder. At a certain point, we hit the freezing line. Mm -hmm. Now, at what temperature does water freeze? Anyone? Anyone? I heard it. 32 degrees. That's right. So 32 degrees is where our freezing line is within the thunderstorm. Okay? So let's pretend in this particular thunderstorm, it's right here where that line is formed, that dashed line. So when we're freezing, remember, everything up from here is ice. You look up into those whitest clouds, you're looking at ice. That's why it's super white sometimes, and it's just a collection of ice, right? Well, what happens when a lightning strike, a bolt forms, that charge occurs, and we go from 32 degrees in that area, let's just say in that same regional, right, of the thunderstorm, to 60,000, from 32 to 60,000, right, in a matter of lightning fast, right, that quickly. That's that expansion, that rapid expansion of air is what starts to create thunder, okay? So as always, you cannot have thunder without lightning. Lightning makes thunder. And we know the phrase, when thunder roars, go indoors. When thunder roars, go indoors. We mentioned that if you're outside on a golf course, on a soccer field, get into a car, get into a building, get into anything that's a structural you know, surrounding, but then if you have no choice, get as low as you can get as small as you can, because that's where lightning will not hit. I mean, it's looking for the tallest object. And that's why your parents say, oh no, you can't play outside right now. Exactly. Even if they hear a rumble off in the distance or the thunder wasn't very loud. I mean, it's so truly amazing how fast and how phenomenal the weather is. I mean, you can have a sh lightning strike a few miles away and then literally have one in your front yard. So Travis wants to know, Bill, doesn't it come from the ground first? It's interesting, mm -hmm. yes. Travis, not every time. So the strike channel, as I mentioned, is an important part of formation of lightning because of the fact that it can. There have been lightning strikes slowed down frame by frame where you saw the bolt start here and go up. So it is a combination. Great question from Travis. I got Travis. another one for you. All right, I'm on now. Jennifer Kay, she says, why does the amount of water in the cloud depend on how dark the cloud is? So... Number one, it's not only dark because of the amount of water, but it's also dark because of what that water droplet condensed upon. So if it condenses on a lot of dirt and part particles that are in the atmosphere, that's going to also change the color of that cloud. You know, we even talked about sometimes you see a green color, like with lightning. Right. Or like with a thunderstorm in, in, a, in a snowstorm. Mm -hmm. Thunder snow. And it does happen. In fact, there's a great video of Jim Cantori, one of the best in the business. He's been with the Weather Channel for years. And he's outside in a snowstorm and it thunder snowed and he goes bananas. That's something to Google later. But um, yeah, that's okay. You know, uh, essentially, it's mainly the amount of water, but it's also some of the par particles that that water is condensing upon. All right. So, yes, we have from Philip Smith, when thunder roars, go indoors. He agrees. Um, a lot of you, all, we, we really appreciate your questions because um, I think that Sometimes these things are hard to understand, especially if you're a parent trying to explain it to your Eddie dad. wants to know if climate change is allowing cloud tops to reach this height. No. This was, thunderstorms reach this height, and maybe, I, I've seen upwards of 65, I've never seen like 75 or 80,000 foot tops. But when we, we have the technology now with our radar, we slice these supercells. This is a supercell thunderstorm, by the way. We use that term when it's a supercell, okay? And when that happens, and you've got that tremendous updraft and downdraft, and it's creating winds of 50 plus and maybe some small hail. That's a developing supercell thunderstorm. Well, when that's happening, it's building. And really, climate change hasn't affected that at all. These have been around for as long as we've studied thunderstorms, yeah. right, and their development. Bill, can you talk about, because we, talk, we mention cells in our forecast all the time. If somebody didn't know 
Well, supercell, what, what's the cell? How would you best describe that's that? A, that's a great question because I don't know the origin of calling it a supercell thunderstorm. Yeah. I really don't know. I mean, you know, super cell, I mean, an individual thunderstorm, you know, is how I've always understood it. But mm -hmm. that it is a building severe thunderstorm, that you've got the potential mm -hmm. of producing larger hail, mm -hmm. larger wind speeds. So the, adding the super to it. So when you hear us say, Oh, you know, we have a cell over here. This if you cell. ever hear a meteorologist talk about it, essentially they're referring to a storm. So, so that's now, good to know. While we're talking about that and supercell, there's also a term mesocyclone. Once we get into this thunderstorm <laughs> and we start to see the winds and what could be some rotation. Because again, with these super strong and, and fast winds, feeding in and downdraft, updraft, or com combining, sometimes this is where the spin can begin, this tremendous amount of wind energy. And remember, the other part of the tornado formation is when you're going up inside this storm, the wind speeds are getting faster the higher you go. And that's called wind shear. And when we're in a wind shear environment where thunderstorms are developing and there's good wind shear available, that's when you can start to see that vortex and that's when it starts to be turning into a mesocyclone where we're having some rotation. Yeah, that is definitely a good word to explain. And I've heard him use it before too <laughs> during a forecast. So I'm glad that you're joining us so that we can talk about it. Uh, also, just do you want to go ahead? We had a question from um, one of our people tuning in saying that can a tree split in half from lightning? Because we mentioned it kind of sure. blows up. But literally, it is strong enough that it can split it directly. Oh, absolutely. And that's why lots of times during storms, you see, yes, wind is obviously a big factor, but if there has been a lot of lightning causing damage, you will see parts of trees. And it can also do the same thing to structures as well. Home right. or building can cause severe damage. This is another thing I think that um, can help you at home. Remember, because when I was growing up, you would hear the big loud thunder inside when I, you know, we were safe inside and I would always get scared. Remember, the worst is already over. The thunder comes after. That's so true. That's very true. Once you hear the thunder, that thunder can't hurt you. It's the lightning before it, before that happened. That's the dangerous part if you're outside in a dangerous situation. So once you hear that thunder, remember that thunder cannot hurt you because the lightning's already happened. And that rattling, you know, I mean, it, it has happened. I mean, I, I had told the story about when lightning hit our driveway and sidewalk. I mean, the, the, the vibration, I mean, the window, we thought the windows broke. You know, I wasn't actually home at the time, but my wife tells me that, I mean, it, 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 the whole house shook. And I know a lot of you have experienced that for sure. And that's what gets your attention. Because again, it's mm -hmm. such a powerful part of nature that the energy and, 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 and the reach of what we're talking about can, again, sometimes be mind boggling. And send the dogs under the bed. Oh, or, big time. Yeah. What's pups. funny is Campbell barks at every little thing, but thunder does not phase her at all. And I don't, really? and it can be so loud. It'll shake the whole building. And she just, she'll make, if she's asleep, she'll look up like, can, can you all stop that? I'm trying. To yeah, exactly. You know, like I'm, it, but it's bizarre. <laughs> but in most dogs, yeah, it will send them running under them. So make sure also during a storm, you want to make sure that your dogs are in a safe place. Um, because if they are for some reason outside, sometimes they'll run away. Fireworks have the same effect mm -hmm. on them, those big loud sounds. So thunder and pets, you'll make sure your pet's safe too. All right, so I wanted to show you how hail forms within one of these supercell thunderstorms. Because again, we're looking at a, the perfect structure of a well-developed thunderstorm. And what'll happen is you have a piece of ice that is about to drop, all right? So let's just make it this large. And on its fall, it's now starting its descent, right? It hits this updraft, or I should say this updraft hits it and puts it back up towards the top of the thunderstorm. So as this is falling as precipitation, remember, it's already in the cold enough air to keep it as ice. Mm -hmm. Now, as it falls, remember, temperatures are getting warmer as we're getting closer to the surface, right? And as we're warming up, then that hailstone might melt, might change shape, might you know shrink a bit. But usually, I mean, it is a good ball of ice. So it's gonna be falling at such a rate that it won't melt too much at all. But in the event that it's just a small little stone, let's say a marble-sized pea hail, you know, pea-sized hailstone, as it's coming down, the updraft takes it back to the top. Okay, it doesn't get far enough to get out of that cloud and reach the surface. Updraft strong enough, it gets back up here. Well, now our hailstone gets larger. Mm -hmm. It's collecting more ice. 
okay? And that's why we go from now, say a pea or marble size hailstone, now we've got a golf ball size hailstone. So it's on its descent. But boy, that updraft, it hits 100 miles per hour maybe. And it takes it back up to the thunderstorm top. And we get even more ice. So now we're going from our golf ball, now we're getting up to about a tennis ball size hailstone, okay? Each and every time, collecting more and more ice. And again, doing these trips within the storm. That's why we always say when you take that picture, sometimes it's translucent enough that you can actually see the rings inside the stone. That's right. Bo Diesel from Fair Oaks Rants, she wanted to know why hail has the rings when you cut it open. So that's why. Already got that one. And then also, during a thunderstorm, is it safe to stay in your car since the tires are good insulators? Yes. It's safe mm -hmm. inside of a vehicle during a thunderstorm. Rubber on the road is one of the biggest reasons. You're looking for things that will not be a conductor of electricity, like water. You know, the most dangerous spot is a pool because if lightning hits that body of water and you're in it, the water's going to conduct that electricity. And you will, if you're in that water, your body will be a conductor of electricity. And that's, that's, that's deadly. I mean, you know, that's not going to be good. So the most important thing is out of any pool, for at least 30 minutes after you hear the last clap of thunder. Because remember, the most important thing, if you hear thunder, lightning can strike where you're standing. If you're outside and you hear thunder, lightning can strike where you are. It happened here, tragically enough, in Westover Hills, and I remember covering it. We had an isolated thunderstorm, just like this one, producing a tremendous amount of lightning, right? And in Westover Hills, it wasn't even raining. And there was an 11 year old boy playing in his backyard and lightning struck him and killed him. Mm -hmm. It's a true story. And it happened, it was six, seven miles away from the thunderstorm itself. It wasn't even raining. He was outside playing. It was overcast. You know, maybe I wasn't there. Maybe he didn't hear the thunder. Maybe he didn't have that warning. Because like you said, yeah. when you hear the thunder, the lightning's already occurred. Right. Um, but that means that most likely more lightning's coming. So that's why that's you still right. need to get inside and be and, safe. And, it, and it's also something to remind all of you that you stay alert. I mean, when we have thunderstorms in the forecast, we do know that days out ahead of time. I mean, we know when a cold front's coming. We know kind of the scenario of what severe potential the environment has. You know, if we have that wind shear, if we have the ingredients that could make a supercell thunderstorm. And you might ask, okay, now that we're talking about, what are those ingredients? Well, one of them is a good tropical, humid atmosphere. This storm's got to feed. This storm's got to use that fuel to grow. And the fuel, the food it loves to feed on is warm, tropical air. Then you need cold air aloft. Before this thunderstorm occurs, you need these kind of temperatures at about, say, 15,000 feet. You've got to drop. You've got to have cold air on top so that when this storm builds, the convective process can occur. And that's what it does, is warm air going into that cold air. Sometimes we have what's called the upper level cap. Mm -hmm. we, you hear us sometimes we use the word cap, we're capped off. We have the dome, right? Well, that's warm air on top of warm air. So when, when you're rising up, when you go from warm into more warm, you don't have the convective process occurring. You know, instead, you'll start seeing these clouds build. You can start usually seeing them mid-morning to, you know, the noon hour. And you start seeing some of those cumulus clouds build vertically. Mm -hmm. That's when you're getting into an environment that could produce afternoon thunderstorms when you hit the right temperature. Because it also takes a lot of heat to get these going. So I was a lifeguard for the city of Dallas for several summers when I was in high school and college. And that's why when you're swimming, you don't want to be in a pool, obviously, when there's lightning. If we saw lightning or even heard thunder, no matter how far away it was or if it was only one clap, we still made everybody get out of the pool and they had to stay out of the pool for half an hour. And if we heard thunder again, then it was another half hour because it's not safe. And I love this question from Andrea Boroff. If I mispronounced your name, I'm sorry, but it says, what happens if lightning strikes the ocean? Well, since it's an ocean, you're probably most likely not going to see it, right. especially if it's in the middle of the ocean. And but it does. I mean, all it, the it, time, all the time. <laughs> Remember, this planet is more than 70 percent water. So chances are it's going to hit <laughs> water before it hits the land, right? Yeah. So I would imagine, I mean, that charge will be in that water in that area until it just kind of runs out. It won't be charging all the way up to the shoreline right. or anything like that, but it would definitely conduct that electricity yeah. 
as long as it could. It's okay. still dangerous, just most likely, obviously, since it is far enough out. As Bill mentioned, it will dissipate once it's thinned out. And it's, I don't think it's going to hurt anyone unless you're in a boat. You don't want to be in a boat in a storm either. Oh, my gosh, right? <laughs> no. Like, you ever see, uh, what was the movie about the... Um, there have been with so George many. George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, but the, the big one when they were out. Oh, is it The Perfect Storm? Perfect Storm. Yeah. How did I forget the name yeah. of that one? That was based on a true story. It was a true story. Yeah. Yeah, and it was an incredible, uh, well-done film on, on just, you know, being out there and being at the mercy of that weather. That's why, again, once again, I stress that you stay alert and stay informed, mm -hmm. you know, because it's the knowledge of when these storms are coming and where they're moving that saves you from the, you know, circumstances or the consequences of severe weather. Remember, we can stay out ahead of it, we can take cover, but, you know, because the storms are always gonna be a part of our life. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're always gonna have thunderstorms, especially here in San Antonio. I guess just to reiterate, what I was trying to say is water and lightning don't mix since lightning is electricity and water and electricity don't mix. So that's a good- Sonny good wants to, to know what happens when lightning goes to another cloud. From cloud to cloud lightning, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll hear that rolling thunder. You know, you'll hear that out there. And again, that, that's always a good warning that we've got a, a very electric environment, if you will. And if you're hearing thunder, it's time to go inside. And that's one of the things, again, that if you're out, say you're playing soccer and you start hearing thunder and they're not canceling the game. I, I would stress to the referee, look, we've got, th I mean, they would stop the game. I hope there would be responsible enough adults to stop any game. But as even the player or the student or the young person, respectfully tell those elders that are around you, we need to stop right now because this is life-saving information. Lightning can strike where we are. I'm hearing thunder and you've got to wait at least 30 minutes till after that last clap of thunder. Now here's the beautiful thing. Talked about some of the technology at our stadiums. We've got sensors on all of our school district stadiums. The Ferris Stadium, we've got it out at Hero Stadium, and those can detect lightning up to 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as they detect anything, they stop the game, everyone, you know, get into the tunnels and we'll wait it out, get the kids off the field, and then we'll resume 30 minutes after that detection is no longer there. I like this question, Bill, because I think it's a good one. What is the difference between hail and sleet? That's from Stacy Peterson. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. So remember that hail is ice. Sleet is going to be what is happening to the precipitation on its way down. Yes, it's going to freeze back to ice, but it starts out, sleet starts as rain. And as it's passing through the layers of the atmosphere on its way down to the surface, it's all in the same layer of the troposphere, yes, but it's passing through different layers of temperature, then it's going to refreeze, okay? And sometimes it, it, it's a combination of the refreeze and then it melts a little bit more and we get what's called grapple, kind of that, you know, it's G-R-A-U-P-E-L and it's um, kind of that, com that hybrid between, you know, a sleet, pellet because mm -hmm. we call them sleep pellets and we call these hail stones uh -huh. and remember the other big difference hail is going to be in the spring to summer like thunderstorm they can happen all year but you typically spring and summer and then sleet is part of a winter weather event so it's really a seasonal thing as well but great question a lot of confusion a lot of times you will have a winter event and be like, it's hailing and it's yeah. just sleeting and we also talk about microbursts a lot Ooh, good I, one I, yes so a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of downdraft. And so that's what leads to, and I'm glad you brought that up, straight line winds. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they're often confused with tornadoes. And you'll go in and, and they'll do the storm damage assessment and say, this looks like straight line winds because the path is going straight. There's no kind of twist to any of the damage, mm -hmm. right? So we, didn't, we don't see circulation. Right. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you feel like <laughs> you don't want to be outside when you have these super powerful straight line winds because you will feel like you got slapped in the face. Yeah, oh, and it's, it's, it's just, unbelievable. They're I mean, dangerous. Because again, these speeds are coming out of this storm top at 85 to 100 miles per hour, okay? Mm -hmm. And when it hits the surface, it comes down to that tremendous amount of speed and just shoots out in a straight line. That's the straight line wind. Watch out. See, I'm getting yeah. all excited here. No. And so <laughs> it, it hits the surface and shoots a straight line because it's, it's coming straight down. So uh -huh. it's got to hit and go, yeah. right, in some direction. And it's still moving at a, a pace of about 100 miles an hour easily. Well, and that's why after a storm, sometimes people will think, well, a tornado must have hit this, you know, this I building or whatever. Path, yeah. Right. But 
And so many times, or so many cases, that's a microburst, but sometimes their damage can mimic something from a tornado. So, um, and then they're also very quick, and it's just an isolated, just one isolated oh, area yeah. where you had this intense down push of wind. So, um, yeah, microbursts are, are super interesting, and They're I think we scary. talk about them a lot. Yeah, they yeah. are scary, and and unfortunately, I think more frequent than people mm-hmm. realize. Yeah, and we talk about them a lot. So next time we mention a microburst, cleared that up. Now you know. <laughs> now you know. So let me show you too. I want to give you guys an idea since we're talking about severe weather and these kind of thunderstorms. I'm keeping it's my important soap. to recap. No, you're good, right? All right. You don't okay. have to move a muscle because okay. I'm just going to hit this space bar. And the most important thing, you've got to know your county and you've got to know your city. Okay? Know where you are because severe weather warnings, remember, are issued county by county. And we, we covered this on our Severe Weather Tuesday, but it's always important to recap because, again, what you're looking at, this is the most important thing we do here. Now, these graphics, they're not current. Okay, these we just use to show you what a watch looks like. Several counties over a longer period of time. Notice in the upper right, until 8 a.m. So it'll be a longer stretch, say a six to eight hour window. Then we get a severe thunderstorm, like I showed you here on the, on the graph or on the, on the, on the board, right? We, we have built a well-structured severe cell where we have a tremendous amount of updraft. We've got a good amount of downdraft. We've got a growing thunderstorm. I always like to consider it like a, it's almost like a living, breathing organism. Mm-hmm. I mean, it takes in that big inhale of humid tropical air. It exhales. Remember, it's never warm after a thunderstorm, right? We will see temperatures drop 20, 30 degrees yeah. after a thunderstorm moves through. I know you've experienced that. It gets really cold mm-hmm. because all this cold air is coming down with the precipitation as well as with that downdraft wind. So again, know your counties and when warnings occur, take action. Remember, we talked about having your plan. Now look on the right. See that little yellow shaded polygon? This is what's great about our technology today. Years ago, they would just say, well, it's a warning for Edwards County. Well, if I live in Rock Springs, let's use that as an example and on that current map. If I live in Rock Springs, yeah, I'm in Edwards County, but I'm out of the reach right now of that severe storm because the concern area is inside that yellow box. So you see, that's what's key about knowing where you live, knowing that county, but then the technology has gotten to the point where we now have these polygons from the National Weather Service giving us an idea where the exact concerned area is going to be yeah it's really and it's amazing i mean that is up to the second information so if they update that then that immediately goes to our graphics here at ken's and if they've extended a watch or a warning or put it up a new one i mean we know almost instantaneously almost as soon as they do as soon as they put it out so that's why that's so helpful to be able to to share that with you at home it's helpful for you all to to tune in when there is a potential severe weather situation. Elisa wants to know temperature of lightning. And as Stacia mentioned, it's as hot as the surface of the sun. It's estimated an average of 60,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's incredible, right? I mean, when it's hot outside, it's 90. When you're baking cookies, 375. When you're making pizza, 600, because you need a really hot oven. But a bolt of lightning, 60,000. All right, so we talked about hail. When this storm becomes severe is when that hailstone is one inch diameter or larger. A pea-sized hailstone doesn't mean it's a severe storm, but I showed you about those rings, and you can kind of see them there, you know, just a little bit in our, in our graphic here. But the most important thing is that it's super cold, and you cut that thing open, and that's when you're going to see those rings. And then the wind speeds. To not only have the hailstone of, of, of the size of a quarter or larger, but you also need winds being produced at about 58 miles per hour or greater. And this is a great graphic to illustrate that downdraft and how that microburst can occur. And you can also see, again, that anatomy of a well-structured thunderstorm. Again, kind of almost the shape of a tooth with that base, and then they build vertically. Again, that convective process builds it from top to bottom and you get that tremendous inhale of good warm air, humid air that builds this thing. And then it, of course, goes higher and higher into colder and colder air. And that's also what it'll feed upon to get a lot larger. 
So this is from David Dye, and I like it because, you know, we talk about watches and warnings a lot involving thunderstorms. And he said, can a watch be a threat? So a watch means, if we issue a watch, that means that literally what the word means to. That's kind of how I think people can remember it. We're watching. We're watching. We're, 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 it's a possibility, <laughs> you know. So essentially a watch and a warning, there is the threat there. But a warning is more serious. A warning is like, okay, we were watching and now there's a very good chance this could happen. Yeah. And so anytime a tornado warning, that's why we break in because you don't mess around with, with a, tornado a tornado warning. warning. Right. Yeah. You don't mess. It's just a very potentially dangerous situation. So that's why when we break in and say, hey, we've got a tornado, tornado watch is very serious too. That is something that needs to be paid attention to. But once we upgrade that to a warning, that's even more serious. And that's when you need to make sure you're in a safe place. Great example was about a week ago. We were wrapping up the 10 p.m. news and we had the threat of some weather coming in. And so I'm in the weather center, I'm watching the radar, and there is zero return. From San Antonio west to Del Rio, the radar is clear. Now we're cloudy and we're still expecting the storms to develop, but they weren't materializing just yet. See, because just like a, I always use the analogy of a Spurs game, you know? There you go. I mean, you can have all the ingredients, you can know everything about the Spurs and they're playing the Knicks. And on paper, we've got better players. We should beat them, well, maybe not this season, right? <laughs> but in years past, right? We've got the Spurs and they're looking really good. We've got all these great players that average this many points. We've got the Knicks, they don't average as many points. We should beat them. On paper, it looks good, right? But we still gotta play the game. We still have to see how the game goes mm -hmm. and play it out. Same thing here. We've got the ingredients and we can say, okay, there's a chance that we develop some strong thunderstorms, but now well, let's watch and see what happens. Yeah. We've got to let it play out. It's the atmosphere. It's an imperfect science. We're, we're predicting based on computer models and based on some very sophisticated technology, but we still have to let it play out. So that particular night, it's not playing out yet. I mean, we're not seeing any storms develop, right? So I'm, I'm writing the email, literally saying, because we always brief each other, like for the next shift, and I'm writing this email for all of us, but primarily Paul Morellis was going to be coming in. This was like about midnight, and he should be here by about 2 a.m., right? So I'm writing out, you know, just, hey, nothing's materializing. Newest model data, our future forecast, what we think the radar is going to look like, is saying it's looking like more about 3.30 or 4 a.m. that it's going to start to materialize, right? Well, at that same moment, I hit send on that email. It wasn't about five minutes later, tornado watch is yeah. issued. I'm like, it's not even raining, right? But it wasn't San Antonio. It was out for our viewers across the hill country from Del Rio up to about Fredericksburg, tornado watch issued. Mm -hmm. Because again, meteorologists that study the atmosphere are seeing the ingredients, not seeing a tornado yet but we're watching because it looks like all the ingredients, we got the wind shear, we're humid, we've got this front, and so it could happen. Mm -hmm. Again, it could with a watch. A warning, it's happening, it's occurring. Let's find out where's the storm because if it's a warning, it's out there for sure. All right, some more questions. Can a hailstorm produce a tornado? Ezra wants to know. Absolutely, Ezra. So when we talk about the sophisticated severe thunderstorm, the amount of wind energy, the amount of wind shear, and those are things that we know out ahead of this development, okay? Because this will create the winds inside, like we talk about. But the environment surrounding it is where we're looking for that wind shear, where we're looking for another term, cape convective areas potential energy okay it's it's within that acronym what kind of environment are we looking at with the amount of potential energy right so when this storm develops is this environment going to make it worse it, the pre-existing condition is the best way to look at that there's a pre-existing condition of the atmosphere right before these storms start and it can you know make or break one of these big storms I think it's also, it's lots of times we talk about the different sizes of the thunderstorms and then essentially the different sizes of tornadoes. So Bo from, Bo Diesel, I like your name, from Fair Oaks Ranch wants to know what makes an F5 tornado? Oh, that's really good. Yeah. What makes an F5 tornado is wind speeds in excess, I forget the scale off the top of my head. So we judge it by speeds. Right. So the, the faster those winds are, the stronger those winds are, the larger that tornado is, basically potentially more destructive, then it goes up in scale. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it can, I mean, come out of one of these severe thunderstorms. And we're kind of recapping and go through this because 
it's always the most important thing we do is warn you of severe weather. We, we did a lot of detail on this Tuesday, but remember that you have to take action. Taking action is having a plan. You know, I mean, you've got to know what you're going to do before it happens. As a matter of fact, here's a great analogy. Any baseball players out there? You know, I used to, I loved playing baseball when I was little, and then I coached for a little while. And one of the things you teach a baseball player is that before the pitcher throws the pitch, say to yourself what you're going to do if the ball comes to you, okay? I don't care what position you are. Catcher, right field, shortstop. If the ball's hit to me, I'm throwing it to second. If the ball's hit to me, I'm throwing it home. Mm -hmm. If the ball's hit to me, I'm throwing to my cutoff, or I'm throwing it first. Whatever it is, decide before the pitch is even thrown. Same thing, same principle here, because once you're in it, it's too late. You, you know, you can't get the ball and then, uh, what should I do now? I guess, uh, <laughs> no, there's not time. You want to have a plan in place. Have the plan. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. the plan up on the screen. An interior room, sometimes a stairwell or a hallway on the lowest floor, but sometimes a bathroom that's not going to have a large window or a window at all. And again, you're surrounded by interior walls. It's crucial. And again, this is posted from Tuesday on our videos here. We deal more with flooding since this is Flash Flood Alley. So just like the watch and warning, same thing. A flash flood watch means that there's a possibility of some flooding. The warning means we see flooding. Mm -hmm. We've got reports somewhere of water over the road, of maybe water coming out of a river, out of its banks. It's flooding. So you have to then start taking action depending on where you are. And that's why, again, you have the Ken's 5 app and you put on Ken's 5 television, that's when we're, or right here on Facebook, that's when we're going to be warning you and showing you exactly where those storms are moving, how long they're going to last, and what you can expect. So it's all very crucial information. And again, I can't stress enough that if you want a little bit more in-depth on severe weather, it's on that Tuesday video or, of course, right here on our Ken's 5 YouTube channel, you'll be able to find it in the glossary. All right, any closing comments or questions as we kind of wrap things up? I do like this. Does, can wind blow lightning? Where, lightning, once it happens, it's pretty determined already where it's That's going. That's a good question. Because <laughs> think about the speed of lightning. So, no, light, wind can't blow lightning. Right, uh, like could it, you know, you could mm -hmm. almost conceivably see what you're thinking. I, I mm -hmm. see what you're thinking, and, and it's not mm -hmm. a bad thought. Like yeah. where that strike channel, is that strike channel influenced by wind, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and again, I don't think so. I mean, ultimately, I don't know so exactly. You don't, right, so you don't have to worry about lightning blowing over and hitting right. you, striking but a, you. A bolt will not be affected mm -hmm. by wind. You know, the bolt is in that strike channel. Think about it as a column, okay? Mm -hmm. We first get that column, the lightning strikes within it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, again, most times, it is cloud to ground. But sometimes, when you slow down, if you look at some lightning videos frame by frame, you'll see there have been instances where lightning has struck from, top, from bottom to top. Yeah. The channel, again, just starts creating it at the surface instead of at the cloud. Now, you know what? It's honestly a good question because if you oh, think thanks, about Debbie. it, right, winds can blow storms. So technically, if the lightning's with the storm cell related to that and the wind's blowing the storm, I guess in theory you could say, Wind blows lightning through storms. <laughs> through storms, right, right, exactly. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now remember too, when, and I'm glad the station mentioned that because when we're giving wind speeds, it's the speed that the thunderstorm is developing. Mm -hmm. The winds that are coming down and shooting out, okay, the winds around this cell, okay, when we're talking about the, the storm is moving at 30 miles per hour. Yeah. Typically, that's an average, about 30 miles per hour is how fast these storms move. That's like the car driving down the road, okay? It's not the winds around the storm, because mm -hmm. these kind of thunderstorms will produce winds, as I showed you, 60 plus, okay? Then the direction, sometimes they slow down, they're only moving at 15 miles an hour, mm -hmm. maybe 30, 45 miles an hour, some of them move a little quicker. But normally, you don't see them moving faster than, say, 50 miles an hour. Yeah, and then we're able to, it, it's, it's interesting, we'll see it on the radar, and if it is moving, let's say 15 minutes, it's a fast moving storm, we are literally watching it in real time creep closer to mm -hmm. our viewing area. So, um, yeah, that's so thing I'm so thankful we have those radars. That's how we're, we're able to help people. And lots of people what at home. What a change in that. Yeah, right? can I mean, access that technology. it too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
All right, it's going to wrap it up for our Thursday edition of the Weather Minds Weather Classroom. The great Stacia Wilson, thank you again. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Can I, thank I backed you up for our social distancing and yeah, making sure that we stay feet. apart. But this that's why I'm over is, here yeah, in this corner. Absolutely. And you guys stay safe at home. Stay safe, stay home. That's the most important part, but stay informed. We're so glad that you joined us. Again, this is going to live here forever on Facebook and YouTube. Join us tomorrow. It's Fun Time Friday. We're going to enjoy some pictures and some stories from you guys. We'll also answer some great questions that have been coming up. And, you know, I'm going to go through a lot of them and, and let that be our content for tomorrow. So make sure to join us once again for our Weather Minds Cloudy with a Chance of Learning. We love you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And we'll see you on First at Four. Bye, guys.